We're going to begin with Father Dominic Gerlach, CPPS um, at St. Joe, and he joined the history part department here in 1952. So he's been here a couple of years. I have to admit, there was a typo on his wonderful notes, and it said that he became a historian in 1858. <laughs> But I suspect it hasn't been quite that long, although he seems to luckily know a lot. So he's the college archivist and historian since then. In the archive collection, there was a collection of copies of correspondence re relating to the local Indian school from the National Archives and the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions both in Washington, D.C., and some items from the archives of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament gathered by Father Edward Maziar. Father Gerlach's interest in this collection came about when he began to teach a course on the American frontier in the 60s. Since there was fairly, it was a fairly general course, he turned his focus on one aspect of the frontier, namely that of Indians. So it became a practical purpose of the history of American Indians. Another reason for this was the civil rights movement among the Indians that caught national attention in the 60s and 70s. He delved further into the story of the Indian school, Drexel Hall, by extending the collection of documents begun by Father Maziars. A small part of his research appeared in the Indiana Magazine of History, March 1973, it was about this time that Drexel Hall was honored by both the Indiana Historical Society and the National Register of Historic Places. The former society provided the marker on 231. Father Gerlach introduced his presentation with a number of slides, which will be followed by a lecture that focuses on the human experience of what transpired at Drexel Hall when it was the St. Joseph's Indian Normal School, 1888, to 1896. Father Gerlach. Good evening. Good evening. Glad to see you here. I'll try not to be a disappointment. <laughs> I'm going to begin with uh, showing some of this. Well, there we go. Uh, that was the sign that uh, Mrs. Candy just talked about, and it tells you the whole story in brief. I should give Charlie Shutro of the information office here credit. He's the one who pushed this on the occasion that I wrote the article. We worked together on that to some extent. Um, that's just another view of his close up. I think we can all see that. That gives you the gist of it. By the way, before I forget, and I can forget so easily, and I get the dates mixed up, not by one year or by 10 years, but always by a century. <laughs> but anyway, the article that appeared in the Indiana History Society, you're welcome to a free copy. There might be enough here to go around, so you can pick them up afterwards. And also as a souvenir, free copies of the uh, Drexel Hall, as it looked later on. Uh, I, I could spare, I want to get rid of them anyway. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, gotta be truthful, historian. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's go on then. This is the way that the Sari building looks today. Uh, by the way, what is in that magazine article was written over 20 years ago. And most of what I'm going to say is not in there. So it might be a reason to pay attention. I understand we're dealing with architecture this evening, so I went back and checked my file. And uh, I discovered that the plans were finalized to build the school in March of 1888. March. And the building was open to students by the f August of that same year. Tremendous. Uh, the size uh, is 85 feet by 80, and the courtyard was much larger at that time, 36 by 40 feet, when it was 
remodeled into a residence hall for the college, uh, a whole tier of rooms were added at the west end of the patio, making it much smaller. The stone which, which marks the uh, bottom or the ground floor there is eight feet tall and it was brought in from, an, from a stone quarry less than four miles from the school. The uh, square footage of the entire building is estimated at slightly over 19,000 square feet at the time, and the cost was estimated to be not more than 19,000, the same figure, dollars, so one dollar per square foot. And Dr. Nichols shakes his head. <laughs> and the wall was made quite thick, as we know now, because they were concerned that this is a pretty cold area. They did not want frost to penetrate through the wall, uh, walls of the uh, building. Okay. I'm not accustomed to these, this technology. Here is the first picture of the school. I can't see it too well. Okay, this isn't just too clear. This was, picture was taken, you can see a cornfield around here. And uh, there it stands, a little tower with a bell in it. Uh, there is one, two, three, dormitory fourth floor, but no dormitory above the east end there. That's one floor less. A very sizable ice, ice house. And the Indians uh, procured the ice. They had to cut it from the Iroquois River. Those little lakes that were formed in the river before it was dredged. And they filled us up. And that, of course, lasted through the whole summer. And part of this was cellars for, for uh, storing fruit and other produce of the gardens and so on. And a very sizable building back here, roughly the size of our computer building, exactly the same size, uh, was the industrial training building to uh, teach Indians the arts of blacksmithing, the carpentry, and whatever, making harness and things of that, that sort. Now, I hope I don't get lost here. This is a beautiful picture. I mean, it's just a very instructive picture. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the most important person involved in this whole project, and that was Father Joseph Stefan. Uh, he came from Germany, from a well-to-do family, had been trained with the German, the B Bavarian, I should say, army, trained in engineering. But when he was in this country, his father died rather sudden-like, and he studied for the priesthood and was a pioneer missionary in Indiana, particularly at this West End, working out of St. Pierre, going from house to house, rather, because there were no churches. In the Civil War, he gained great prominence locally and nationally. He worked at both as a chaplain and also as an army engineer, and in that he got friendly with uh, politically important people afterwards, you know, because these generals went up into politics. Uh, the Civil War. It, during the Civil War, this was, a, this was a murderous war, as you know, and the one thing that historians underplay in my mind is the role of the Irish. The Irish were the poor people in the North, and uh, wealthier people could buy their way out of the draft, but the Irish had to serve, and they were really the uh, uh, I wish there were estimates as to how many lost their lives. So when the war was over, he was involved with the bishop to get this land which stand on here now. Bought a 900 acres, as a matter of fact. There were several houses on it and the barns and so on. And he hurriedly made his temporary orphanage called St. Joseph's Orphanage and Manual Training School. Was, was, was started here. It was meant to be temporary though. And I was interested what kind of children went here. I checked the um, census report for 1970. There are 70 kids here, all the way from six months up to about f 15 years. And I kid you not, every child had an Irish name. That's right. There were many German settlers in this area. I'm going to talk about Catholics. These are all Catholics, of course. But they were Irish. But just gives you a little bit of indication how much Irish blood was shed for the North in the Civil War. But anyway, when the war was over, I say he uh, organized this orphanage. 
And then the Indian issue came to his attention. He was a very enterprising person. And what happened here, when Grant became president, uh, I guess it was 68, 1868, uh, he wanted to have peace and things look decent and we had an awful war going on out west with the roving Indians uh, caught world attention very negative negative. and so uh, there were a couple of Protestant missionary societies led by the Quakers who approached the president and said you know the problem with the Indians is could be solved very easily the problem is with the Indian agents the political appointees and they, crooked as it can be, they, they abuse the Indians under the charge and so on. Why don't we uh, have the various mission societies uh, take over the agencies, appoint the agents from their own members? So there were 72 uh, reservations at the time, 72 agencies, and they divided them up with the Catholics receiving only eight, which was a poor arrangement, it was unfair. And so this man here got involved in that and uh, the result was the organization of a national mission society called the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions in Washington. For a while he was an agent himself out west among the Lakotas, but then he was chosen because of his connections in Washington by this time to head this, this, uh, this committee and he went to work to uh, correct the bad arrangement because Catholic missionaries were who had maybe worked for 10, 20, 30 years among certain Indian tribes were simply cast out by the, by the others. So he helped to uh, reform that but at the same time uh, he became interested in the education program for the Indians. Again the federal government looked to private, private work and that would be the missionaries again and the government uh, allowed for a setup called contract schools. If a missionary society would build a school and, and equip it, the federal government would pay $95 per Indian child a year. We call that a contract, contract school system. And uh, that was something very popular. So, uh, well, this thing didn't work too well for Father Stefan but uh, about 1885 or 86, he met a lady in Philadelphia called Catherine Drexel. Now, who was she? She was the one of three daughters of a Francis Drexel who was teamed up with uh, the Morgan Banking Company, both in Philadelphia and New York. It was very, very wealthy. When he died, he made an arrangement that the girls could not get any of the capital, it would be invested, but they could use the proceeds. Now from a 14 million dollar inheritance, there's about a million dollars of, uh, of uh, profit or, you know, pro proceeds from that by investment and so on. Well, Catherine Drexel became very much interested in helping the poorest of the poor, like Mother Teresa would be today somewhat the same idea and the Indians were in a terrible condition. And so he talked with her and she provided money very generously to build schools, watch this equation here, to build schools and equip them. Religious orders were plentiful in those days, Catholic religious orders like Franciscans, Jesuits and so on. They would provide cheap labor, not saying it's bad labor but cheap labor. And pretty soon, this fellow here had organized a, a system of 60 Catholic contract Indian schools, which were taking in pretty soon more money than all of the other mission societies in the country. Its success, of course, would be its, its downfall. So, so this man was quite a, a, a capable person, and we cannot overemphasize him. Uh, he, he, was, he was the heart and soul Okay, later on he was rewarded by being made a Monsignor and he died about 1903. He came to, through this part of the country very often. This is Catherine Drexel as a relative, a young girl. Just want to show you one of the rare pictures of her. Now, 
In 1887, uh, Father Joseph Stefan became interested in boarding schools off of the reservations. As I have to explain this just as I go along. Uh, the idea in, in the 1880s was, of course, to do something positive for the Indian. The Indians had been really knocked about badly, but at the same time, they couldn't do much with Indian children when they went to school and reservation because they went home every day and so on, and you made two steps ahead, then you lost three steps. So the idea was to set up boarding schools at Carlisle Indian School in 19, 1875 or so. A military type of school was set up in, in near Philadelphia. Jim Thorpe was one of its graduates later on, and about three or four others on this side of the Mississippi. The idea was to take the children away from the parents for five years or so and thoroughly wash their Indianness out of them, their Indian language, their Indian culture, their Indian values, and so on. And so the boarding school was seen to be a proper instrument. And uh, so she's the one who forked out $50,000 to buy the land, 420 acres, and uh, build the buildings and so on uh, for this Indian school here, which was supposed to be the model, the best of all the Indian schools in the Catholic system to uh, compete with Carlisle, for example. Now, Catherine Drexel, um, in 1881, became a Catholic nun. She made a trip to Rome and she was advised to found her own order since her interest was the, the blacks and the Indians. And so uh, she organized and started the society or the order of the Blessed Sacrament Sisters. Blessed Sacrament Sisters. Don't know just why the title. But her work was directed only to, to uh, Indians and, and blacks. She founded a black university, for example, in Louisiana. Uh, she's called the millionaire nun. <laughs> but she made the news quite often. By the way, she actually was here. Well, I'll, I'll come to that afterwards. I can't find the buttons of this thing. <coughs> she died about 1956. Uh, this is from a brochure that was printed. Uh, to advertise the uh, school to the Indians out west. The Indians came from reservation, not from around here. And uh, this is a, a good uh, picture, I, I would say. And the uh, water tower just about in place. Uh, that's one of the last. They had well water out uh, west, east of the building, and they had two sisters down below under the patio with water washing down from the roofs. That was used for laundry washing purposes. The other was used for drinking, I guess. This is a picture of the um, industrial uh, house, I say the size of, um, of the uh, computer center, except it was a frame building. I'm going to come back to that later on. Very sizable barn back there. The idea of, of an industrial training school here at St. Joseph Normal Indian School was, was to uh, provide a complete learning experience for the Indians and particularly to teach them the value and the techniques of farming. It was a model farm. Maybe about 250 acres could be farmed because of a lot of water and so on. Uh, but that was part of the idea there. I thought you might be interested in one of the other pictures. The Sisters of St. Francis of Sacred Heart, they were originated in Germany. There's seven of them here. Not precious blood sisters, but they came towards the end. And they took care of the laundry and the um, kitchen. And the rest of here, of course, are Indians. I, don't, I cannot identify these two priests positively. Uh, This is a little bit later picture, 1893, and here we find, uh, here I begin to be able to identify people, Father Andrew Giedel, who is still somewhat remembered in Rensselaer, um, very much involved in the parish and so on. These were precious blood brothers now, some were lay men, 
one of the main teachers, became a brother. And uh, you can see that the Indians are not always particularly young. They range anywhere from seven years to about 18 years. Their education was roughly academically a grade school education, which is a lot. The Columbian Exposition is something that really caught the attention of the people throughout Indiana and the whole country, as a matter of fact. It was the time when Chicago got the nickname Windy City because they really blew up this, this event. And it was, I, with my books, the greatest World's Fair that the world has ever, ever seen. And uh, among the things they showed there was an Indian school because there's so much uh, concern about converting the Indians from their negative, bad way of life to become productive American citizens and share in the blessings of the United States. And this was in Jackson Park, the southern end. There's a railroad going around. People could come. They could walk in and, and see the pupils and so on. And in June of uh, 1893, the, the fair was one year late, 1893, uh, the students, the pupils from this school here with their teacher, with one of the teachers, about 30 students, were on display for about six weeks. And of course they got uh, pretty well uh, seen by the people. One of the interesting things is that down here, un un unfortunately we can't see it, they brought in some Indians from Dakotas, set up the teepees, and showed how, what squalor the Indian lived in, that you could go from there into the, what you call and see the Indian boys. Uh, with her hair cut and dressed in suits and washed and, and uh, all the other nice things. Huh? That's right. And they could recite and sing patriotic songs and do arithmetic and things like that. We're doing wonderful things for the Indian and America was so proud of that. Uh, this is just a picture. Uh, one of the things that it was done here, mostly to make a little money, uh, the Indians loved to uh, dress up in their tribal ways, their bows and arrows, which they loved to sell, or, and so on, and show off generally, do Indian dances, and so on. And this is a formal picture of that s sort of a thing. They performed in the Opera House downtown, in the college here. The college came about three years after the Indian school started. Here's another view of the Drexel Hall, or the Indian school with the Indians underneath. Uh, this picture reminds us that some Indian boys died. They're all boys, by the way. Four of them, by St. Augustine's records, died here. And this one, Hendrix, was buried out, is, is buried out here at Mount Calvary Cemetery. And uh, I, you can almost read that. I took a picture of that. And I always say, well, this will probably be the last relic. I hate to say that. <laughs> of the presence of the Indians here. But that'll last a long time, I'm sure, although the tree next to it is beginning to tip it over. The Indians got sick. The tuberculosis was the principal sickness and uh, because of the climate and so on over here. Okay, the first, the precious blood priest more or less ran the Indian school all eight years in which it was an operation. And the first one was this Father Han, a very remarkable person. Uh, he was transferred from here to another Indian school out in California. Matter of fact, he was sent out there to organize and to build it and to, uh, to uh, take care of it. Uh, that, that was a great move for, for, for him. And uh, once he got out there, he let an order of nuns take over the teaching of the school and he became a missionary who went from place to place. He built 12 churches for the Indians in California area from Banning, that's roughly around San Bernardino, all the way down to the Mexican border. Uh, it was really pioneer work on his part and he just loved that because he loved the Indians. Uh, he just breathed that. So that's a remarkable person, Father Florian Hahn. The Precious Blood Society wanted to come, have him come back here, but uh, he asked to be relieved, and so he went on his own. Now, over in Banning, California, I was interested what he did out there. 
This is a drawing, but this is the Indian school built by Catherine Drexel, of course, of money. And you notice it's the same organization, more or less, as the school out here, around a patio, the same height. The entranceway, however, is a little bit higher, and uh, there's no stone, uh, eight-foot stone wall around it. I guess the materials that they work with out there. There are several schools that look very much like our own Indian school, and it merely shows that uh, Mother Drexel had a uh, architect. I, I can't think of his name right now, and he's the one who oversaw the building of things. This is from the B B Banning, California school, shows uh, Father Han there, and uh, they're making things, they're showing off uh, various crafts that the Indians learn. It was a, a uh, co-ed situation there, showing them in the classroom, which classrooms would have been very similar to the ones here in, in the Drexel Hall. Unfortunately, of course, we've lost all those things. That's the reason I show these pictures. Now to follow up on the story just a little bit, the Indian school lasted only eight years until 1896 when federal funds were cut off, but worse than that, the, the federal government refused us permission to recruit Indians, so that really killed it. So in 1898, the Precious Blood Society took over the entire farm, matter of fact, bought it, and made this into a mission house. Um, and this was, here was, became the birthplace of the Messenger Press. Messenger Press, it's still going at Carthagena, Ohio. It was begun here and they published a monthly religious magazine. And this is a real picture of the printing room in that frame building, and I know some of the brothers, like Brother Herman here, Brother Hyacinth, uh, they, these I think are lay people who worked here. Of course, that was too long ago. I wasn't born until 1921. You see, this was way before that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they started with a second-hand uh, press that they bought from the Chicago Tribune, the equipment, and they started here. In 1922, St. Charles at Carthagena, the seminary, built a brand new huge building and they made provision for a printing press over there, the Femesson Press. So it moved from here in 1922, the press and everything moved and the Society of the Precious Blood then donated the entire farm of 420 acres plus the buildings to St. Joseph's College. From 1922 to 1937, it was merely used as a storehouse for farm things like fertilizer and grain and things of that sort. Again, I wasn't here to, to witness that. And then in 1936, we became a senior college, the biggest year in our history, from being a junior college, almost deciding to close the place. We expanded to a senior college, then we needed to have semi-private rooms. and. Uh, didn't have enough money, so we took that building here and totally remodeled it. You cannot, when you walk inside, you have no idea of what the Indian school was like because everything was converted into uh, semi-private rooms for about 66 students. The stairwells and the, and the walkways are, are iron now, very strong. Uh, a central heating system, things of that sort. When the Indians were here, there were 30 stoves in that building. Could you not? And uh, wood stoves, that's right. Okay, that's 1937 until the, the present. And I think that's the end. Could you turn on the lights for me, please? Boy, that took a long time. It always does. Well, I have about 12 points here to make, and I'm going to make them pretty fast. And I don't know how your interest would be. Number one. Back in 1988, I got the right, that century, 1988. <laughs> 1988, no, 1988, we celebrated the 100th year of the Indian School. And Judge Philip uh, uh, McGraw was pretty much the spirit and work and supporter of that whole thing. That very same time that we celebrated that, the church beatified Mother Drexel, to the status of blessed Catherine Drexel. Huh? 
So we had a double celebration here. And the first thing I told them at the celebration, I said, now, if she becomes a canonized saint, we'd like to be able to associate her with this place here. And so I went through all of my files again, and I found a letter written October the 16th, 1888, to her. I feel exceedingly thankful to you and your good sisters, that's her two lay sisters, not only for your visit, that's right, she was here, but also for all that you have done for us. So uh, there's proof there. Uh, Catherine Drexel was a person who kept close track on her money. Wherever something was built, she'd go out there and see it herself, that nothing was wasted. Beautiful, isn't that? That's the way things should be, shouldn't they? <laughs> All right, number two, the background of the whole thing here. 1888, 100 years ago now, the Indians were at the bottom of their experience. We're thinking particularly about west of the Mississippi. Number one, militarily they couldn't fight our armed troops anymore. The battles were over. Number two, politically they were not independent, but they became wards of the federal government. Number three, they lost their support, their pride in shooting the buffalo and so on, and they were forced to, to take rations from the federal government. And of course they became depressed, suicide, set in alcohol and so on. Fourthly, they were socially despised. Imagine after we had taken all the land away from them, people in Congress talked about, say, this is a big poor house out here on the American taxpayers. That's how they saw the Indians at the time. Number five, there was a move to do something for the Indians. Before they would all be destroyed physically, they decided that they're going to change their ways by force. <laughs> That's right, by force. So in 1887, the Dawes Act provided for the gradual breakup of reservations into private farms of 160 acres apiece. Of course, out in land in which they couldn't make any living, but they made it there. And one southern senator said, our advice to the Indians is to root hog or die. Really rough. And the other thing was education. Uh, that was the positive thing. If we had been very bad with them as far as the physical side is concerned, we owe it to them to uh, share with them the blessings of the American way of life. And this is what was behind this, this whole uh, education thing. Uh -huh. That's right. So they're going to, as I said one time, after destroying them physically, they're now going to destroy them Spiritually, huh? That's right. Reject their ways, their languages, and everything must go. <laughs> Number three, I often wondered how did they get the Indians here to here? See, they brought in from reservations. And the idea was to get them away from their homes, but get them from several reservations, put them together, and you're going to force them to use English as a common language. Now, how did you get the Indians here? This is a contract school. First of all, get permission from the federal government, the number of Indians. Then go out there to the, to the uh, reservations, get the parents' permission. That's right. The mother's permission, ordinarily. And how do you do that? Well, you've got to get acquainted with them. You live with them for a while, like one of our priests did. You wear the cassock and crucifix. That was a very positive thing because the Indians generally had a very positive idea of the Jesuits who were gradually phasing out, you see, but always had a positive image of them. And then the argument... Okay. And, uh, well... The uh, teachers at the Indian school here would tell you that the attachment of parents to the children was extremely strong. How are you going to get them their permission? Well, they use this, this way. If you don't come to our school, they're going to take you to Carlisle. And there, of course, they're, they're, they had a military school. You had jails and you had whippings and things of that sort. 
Yeah, that was tough there. There was no nonsense allowed. So uh, then, of course, you got that. You got the doctor's uh, signature that the kid is okay. Then the agent, of course, had to add his signature, too. Then they started a long, hectic journey by wagon, then by train. And, of course, it was really tough on those poor Indians. Okay. Uh, Lakota Indians, I can't think of the names of those reservations, Standing Rock and one of those. Then there's Turtle Creek Reservation on the border with Canada, those are Ojibwe in Indians, Menominees from Wisconsin. Those were the three largest groups. Then you had occasional Potawatomis and, uh, and let's see, I can't think of the others. <laughs> yeah, okay. You got the idea, though, in other words, yeah. <laughs> Number four, the poor Indian boys coming here. Try to think what a shock this was. I'll make five observations. The first thing they did was crop their hair. Now that was a traumatic experience. That was like unmanning the poor Indian boy, neutralizing him, huh? or neutering, I should say, detribalizing. They felt they were forever cut off from their tribe. Number two, they burned their, their, their clothing that they had and were required to wear shoes. Never had shoes before. And tight-fitting clothes. I like to make the word tight because that uh, was disturbing for them. Number three, they were required to sleep at the same time in beds in, in barrack dorms. They had never slept in a bed before. Um, uh, they much prefer to wrap themselves up in a blanket outside someplace. And it's not surprising that one of the problems they had was bed wetting. I hate to talk about such things. Fourthly, and this was a particular diabolical tool that the white man had, was the clock. That's right. The Indians were accustomed to just moving with the nature, with the day, as their, their spirit moved them, so to speak. Here was this clock, and the bell rang. 5.30, out of bed. And then every step of the day was mapped out, just like it was for the college students here. And 8.30, they went to bed. You don't want to waste too much uh, money on, or resources on, on lamps and stuff of that sort. Now, I could spend a whole long time giving you the whole detail, because there were federal investigators here three times, and they gave very detailed uh, description of what went on here, even what they had to eat, potatoes three times a day, yeah, and uh, how they worked. In other words, it was a combination of work and eating and classroom and, work and, and uh, crafts and so on. Uh, some of the boys were the school was very proud of. There's one Indian boy, they said, that he was able to go to the woods to get the wood and so on, and he eventually fashioned that into a wagon. Well, maybe it's true. I just don't know for sure. I merely go by what I read. So there was, uh, well, I'm not going to go through the whole, whole day here. The supper, what was for supper? Tea or milk? cold meat, potatoes, bread. As the inspector said, ample but monotonous. <laughs> Number five. This was possibly a big thing too. The one thing that the Indian was simply not accustomed to was working, labor. That's right. Uh, they had inherited very early that there's a distinction. Women do the work, men do hunting and fighting, you know, so on. That's right. And that, that was a problem. And uh, so there was one thing that they dragged their heels on uh, and, and tried to dodge as much as possible. That was work. And there was so much to be done. There was 50 Indians, then there were 60, then there were 70. Well, those poor nuns, you know, they didn't have modern tools in the kitchen, stuff like that. Potatoes had to be peeled. And so uh, the Indians did the washing of dishes. And, and there's constantly need to feed those stoves. They had to chop wood and haul it in. They had to bring water in from the outside. You didn't have centralized water. And uh, you had to work out in the fields. Uh, it's just a lot of work had to be done. 
Now, one of the special projects, I always think about when I look at that terrace there in front of the chapel. Beautiful, isn't it? The Indian boys built that by pick, shovel, and so on. Yes. Yeah, they did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they did some other things like that. So the, the inspectors always praised the administration for getting the Indians to work. <laughs> and that's what they were most successful here in. Number five, what was the biggest problem? Well, the amount of the book tells you, of course, was the problem of runaways, huh? That's right. All the Indian schools had that problem. Mm -hmm. um, runaways. So every year there were runaways. One year there were 18. Some were, there, some were caught and reinstated. Some were brought back and then sent home. Occasionally one succeeded and one was killed under a train on the way trying to get home. What could be done to prevent this? Father Han, who was very perceptive, he said, you got to watch their moods. They generally have moods together, you see. And you can sense when things like this are afoot. If it's winter time, you hide their coats, for example. Yeah. <laughs> Now, runaway was one thing. Sometimes they were more ingenious. <clears throat> they would pretend illness. By the way, those Indian boys had great faith in white man's medicine. They, they came up, at first one of the sisters was the nurse. That I don't know just who was the nurse along the line. And they would come in for all kinds of illnesses. But homesickness was also an illness, which was a tough one. Or they would uh, say, well, the parents are ill. They want their children home. OK, so they go home. There are a couple little stories. I'll tell you one here. By the way, only Catholic Indians were allowed to be picked up for the school. And so one Indian boy, learning about that somehow, he went downtown to the home of a Protestant minister and said, I'm, being, I'm not a Catholic. I'm being held here against my will. <laughs> A lot of correspondence resulted upon that, and when the boy had the choice of staying here or going to Carlisle, he decided he was a Catholic again. <laughs> okay, number six, the staff and so on. The only thing I, I can say is that the fellows who ran the Indian school had a pretty hard job. And this will be brought out here because they were under two authorities that were fighting each other. One was the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions, and George, uh, Joseph Stefan, ahead of that, and the other was the Indian Bureau. And the two got into a fight. That's kind of in the text here. And so uh, they simply refused to talk to each other. And so the poor superintendent here had to figure things out from out here uh, what to do. He got orders from the Indian Bureau, he got orders from Father Stefan, and it took a pretty imaginative, patient sort of a person to, to work around all of that. Okay. The uh, boarding school support from the government was a little bit higher than it was out in, in the reservations. It started with $125 per Indian boy per year. Uh, uh, compare that with St. Joseph's College, tuition board and everything was $160 a year. So it's in the ballpark, isn't it? Yeah. And they had to work, however, to make up the uh, d d d differences, of course. By the way, the uh, fight between Father Stefan and the Indian Bureau chief was so bad that Stefan almost every year would have had the school closed except that he twisted the arms in Congress and got this school by name in the budget each year that had to go to this school. So it was tough going. Number seven, the health. I told you about the, the four that died. Number eight, relations with the community was quite good. The Rensselaer Republican was always to me, my, my mind, all the way through, I, I went through so much of it, is very fair towards the Indian School and also to St. Joe College subsequently. Of course, they use unfortunate words sometimes to describe Indians. But they were quite visible in town. They could visit, they could peddle bows and arrows and things like that. They uh, were very good athletically 
And for uh, 1890 to 93, they represented the Rensselaer baseball team in competition with other communities around here. They were called the Young Americans. <laughs> the Young Americans, what a name to, to, to give them. And they beat all teams coming on. It's surprising. Of course, the college wasn't much of a team here. And uh, I, I know in one particular summer, it was at the county fair, they had a baseball game scheduled between the Young Americans and the Monon team. And the Monton team simply decided not to show. Yeah. That's a, quite a few descriptions of how they, they, they played the baseball. Uh, one of the descriptions said, you know that pitcher, he must have eyes in the back of his head because he can peg a guy out in the second base so quickly. Now, number nine, what about complaints about this school? Well, this I get from the government inspectors who were here. And one complaint was, discipline is too mild. And he singled out the fact that when Indian boys went from study area to the dinner and so on, they did not march rank and file. Then sometimes they kept their caps on indoors, like our pumas do. Mm -hmm. Well, Father Hahn writes about this. He writes to uh, Catherine Drexel, not to the Indian Bureau. No, he says different things to the different people he writes to. And he said, I've learned quickly that anything harsh dealing with the Indians is simply counterproductive. You don't whip them. You don't shame them. You persuade them. Be kind. Reward. And they will respect you. And um, he got, got along very well. The second complaint came really from an uh, inspector that was prejudiced against the school. He was out to hack it down. He said there was lack of cleanliness. And he pointed out, he said, the sheets look terrible. The underwear worse. Daily clothes is dirty and torn. And you know what he did? He wrote in there, he said, this is clearly due to the German origin of the sisters and uh, the priests and brothers because it, there's there is their natural trait to be disorderly and unclean. <laughs> And number three, too much stress on religious instruction. <laughs> yeah, too many statues around, crucifixes, all suggesting idolatry. It was a bad, bad time for things like that. Anyway, you can read this. Number 10 is the building. I, I, I got a whole list of all the produce of the farm, the gardens, and glistened turnips and honey and cheese and stuff like that. But number 11, evaluation. I'll probably close with this. To, to take away the Indian culture and make him into a white man is now regarded as a mistake and cruel. But back in those days, it was considered a noble social crusade and duty. I look at the letters of Catherine Drexel and Father Hahn, and I look, I try to find out what motivated them. Well, there had been no Catholic schools like this one or anyone except to protect the faith of some of the Indians who were converts. That was the only reason really for this school, was to protect the faith because it would be gone if they went to Carlisle or to white Indian school at Wabash and so on. Secondly, there was great sympathy for the plight of the so-called poor Indian, obviously exploited, abused, uh, in utter destitution. Uh, but they had little sympathy, however, for keeping the Indian language or culture. They agreed with that. And thirdly, a little bit of a surprise here perhaps, they both uh, regretted the lack of concern on the part of Catholics throughout the country regarding the Indians, including the hierarchy and priests and religious very often. Uh, it was an unrewarding experience. And uh, so those who worked in it were heroic, but uh, the support was very weak. And uh, well, that's about uh, it, as I would say. Uh, I thank you for your kind attention, of course, as usual. I'm happy to have done this for you. If there are any questions, but be sure don't forget to pick up. Probably don't have enough copies of the pictures and the mag and the magazine articles. Okay, Did thank. You have a question? Oh, the question? Yeah. I'm full of answers. Right. <laughs> you heard Father Gale on the before, so I mean, but we 
thank you a yeah, lot. Yeah, sure. And uh, we'll come get the treasures. We have a break now. And then we'll come back in here and hear from Dr. Nichols and, uh, and have a little bit of a tour out to the lobby. So have a break. Have a look at something to drink. And thank you, Father Gerlach. You're going to introduce Kathy later? I could. You'll be doing her now. I might as well do it later. Okay. Later? Okay. They're, they're a duo. <laughs> uh, between Kathy and myself, we've got a mobile presentation that's involved so that you get to see a bit more of the building. I'm just going to talk for maybe 10 minutes here uh, about the core building. Well, the core program, so you have some idea of what this general education program is and that as background for how we built the buildings. I'm going to do the, the material aspects of the building first uh, and then uh, walk out into the lobby a little bit farther down past where your refreshments were. Don't stop again. Uh, and there is this brick sculpture and I have some pamphlets. We, uh, we want to uh, show you, tell you something about the spirit be, that is embedded we hope in the building, our uh, brick sculpture down there in the uh, the main entrance way, and then we're going to move into the large lecture hall. And as Ed Sullivan used to say, Kathy has a really big shoe. <laughs> that is uh, to show you all the bells and whistles and the audiovisual capabilities of, of that room, which are are really fantastic. Or well, every day I learn something else we can do with it, and. Uh, some days when we have a powder outage, power outage, we find out things we can't do with it. Uh, has happened on my. Our core program is a very imaginative, by that I mean it's not imaginative at all, name for uh, a, a wonderful program uh, that St. Joseph's College started back in 1969 that incorporates uh, all of the general education credits. Oh, okay. Uh, there's 120 hours that are required for graduation. 36 credit hours are required in a, a typical major. A minor is 18. We have 45 credit hours in our general education program. That's 37.5% of the 120. And that leaves 21 hours that the students can do, you know, choose what they want. And they do all sorts of creative things, two majors and so forth. The core program is absolutely the same set of courses for every student. And it begins in the freshman year and it runs very evenly through all eight semesters. And that is something, that itself is something that is unique in American higher education. In most places, they count general education as the basic stuff do it first, get it over and done with, and then go on to the major and specialize in something, and that's really important. That specialization thing is a good idea in graduate school, but not on the undergraduate level. And so what our, the message that we've embedded in the very structure of our program is that this core program is every bit as important as the major because it is what broadens a student's horizon as they go from freshman to sophomore. We, we want them to graduate knowing a lot about the whole world, other cultures, uh, about the, the past of 
Western civilization, the Judeo-Christian traditions, the Greco-Roman traditions, all the science and how we fit into this wonderful cosmos and so forth. So the focus of the program is very definitely designed to broaden students' horizons as they go from freshman to senior year. And that's the reverse of what happens in their major where they concentrate more and more. So it's a, a very interesting interaction that, that goes on between the major, that specialization, and the core program which tries to broaden their horizons. The program operates with two, we got a couple of students here who can check on my veracity, my honesty, Jeff. <laughs> um, the program operates in two different fashions. Um, in every one of the cores, there are two mob-sized lectures a week. And you may have attended some. We invite the public to come to any of the, and some for a while, uh, those on the non-Western cultures, India, China, Africa, Japan, Latin America more recently, were, were popular. People would come in and just sit in on those lectures. Uh, and you're always welcome to do that. Um, so we have a lecture. Since all the freshmen together are taking core one this semester, fall semester, we've got about 360, 375 students and the teachers who are involved in that core that come to this 50 minute lecture twice a week, Tuesday, Thursday morning, nine o'clock for core one. Then those 360 students are broken up into small size discussion groups of about 16 to 18 students and those discussion groups are run by the full-time faculty from all kinds of different departments. So each of these cores has a chunk of Western history that it covers, the contemporary America, uh, modern world, the European antecedents, we're all immigrants, uh, you know, some remove, uh, Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans, the Middle Ages, and so that's chronologically organized. But uh, let's take Middle Ages next semester. will be for sophomores, and that course will be put together by a team of faculty, about eight faculty, seven faculty, from maybe five different departments. So we get, it's interdisciplinary, it's team taught. Historians, philosophers, theologians, the people in art, the people in literature, uh, the social scientists, they all get together and teach it collaboratively. They take their turns giving these, again I say, mob-sized lectures. You're a small mob, but Kathy will give you one in the room next door. And then they break up into the small discussion groups. So the way the program is run, conducted on a day-by-day -day basis, is how we set up the building. Uh, if I orient this the same way we are, pretty much. This device is called an ELMO. I have no idea what ELMO stands for. Electronic light magnification overhead or something like that. But it's wonderful. You know, I can put me on it, except <laughs> if I had a three-dimensional object. And Kathy's going to show some of that stuff. This is from the dedication of the building. And we are... Of course, right here in the small lecture hall. We have this magnificent lobby. But the real centerpiece of the whole building is the large lecture hall, uh, named for Peter Shen, who gave a little over a million dollars to the building. Um, around the perimeter of this first floor, if I move this up a little bit, we have classrooms. And those classrooms are fairly small size classroom because they are sized for the discussion groups in core, 16 to 18. But I think we got, you know, officially according to the fire code, we got room for maybe 22 students. So we have other classes in there that are a little bit bigger. And so the freshman core, as I said again, we've got 360 freshmen in core one this semester. And they divide up into probably 16 into 36, 22, 23 different discussion groups. And they will meet at different hours during the week, again, three times a week, uh, but using the rooms around the side. And so we, uh, the one other room that's different is that we've got a, uh, uh, over on this side, a special lab set up for the science section of the core program. 
The other part of it is interesting is that on the second floor, we have, as a nerve center also, a room that we call our core planning center. Groups of faculty, that's right at the intersection of the two hallways up on the, the second floor. The core faculty that are assigned to a particular segment of the core have to sit down and plan that common curriculum. Uh, the lectures that they will have, the readings that the students will do, and some of their common assignments and so forth. And so this is right in the center of the building. It has a library that consists of just about all the books that were ever used in the core program since 1969, so they can check up on something. All the minutes of meetings, um, the syllabi, the, the, the instructions that are given, the schedules and so forth. Uh, it, just about a 98% complete file on the whole history of the program in that one room. Plus, uh, a magnificent computer set up, so, set up, an AV set up, so that you could rehearse a lecture that you were going to give in the other room. When we put the faculty into the building, uh, Bernie Parker, who has since uh, left to be president up in the Boston area, uh, said that what we got to do is mix everybody up. We, we don't want to have history people in this section, uh, all the art people <laughs> in this other section, and so forth. Because the whole idea of the core program, and therefore the core building, is a community of the faculty. Not divided up into separate departments, but you know, a historian next to a literature person and a philosopher next to an art person, uh, so that these interdisciplinary conversations could go on at the place where the faculty are at home, so to speak, in their offices. Um, the other marvelous step forward that we had in building this building, this is to get us real down to earth, is that uh, we put women for uh, until three years ago, you know, to find a woman's bathroom in the, if you came to a play or something in the science building, was a, <laughs> a terrible problem. So this building is wonderfully equipped. It's, unfortunately, it's always cold in here. It's because when you get 300 students in here, you got a lot of heat coming. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start by introducing Kathy Salyers. Kathy is our director um, here of our library services but I think a lot of us met her when she was at the Jasper County Public Library. She was the director there for many years. And uh, I see that she's worked in a variety of other areas, um, from Hartford City Public Library as a children's library, which I think would be wonderful, to a freelance librarian and more. But when she was a Jasper County Public Library director, she had a lot to do with the idea of uh, buildings and helped with the building of the Wheatfield Library and also began uh, thinking about libraries in DeMott and Rensselaer so that there was a lot of history before we actually got our building here. So that's one reason she's here tonight. She's not only our special library person here at St. Joe, but she's had, she's had the background and has become involved with this building, not only electronically, but with all of her history in, in our little bits of decorating that we had a chance to do. So this is Kathy Salyers. She'll be our next presenter. Thank you, Judy. Can everybody hear me OK? All right. We're going to get this show started.
I hope that gets you in the mood and gives you a flavor of what we can do in this room. Welcome to the final part of the presentation. Unfortunately, I had the task of following two very interesting and very informative gentlemen, and I hope that I can live up to that challenge. As you can see from my title slide, I'm going to be talking about the technology uh, included in the core building, plus you're going to get a little bit of a visual tour of some of the rooms that Dr. Nichols was pointing out to you earlier in his presentation. I subtitled this How to Drive a Librarian Crazy because if any of you have ever had to deal with audiovisual equipment, run a, a movie projector, a slide projector, or a cassette recorder, you know that there's great opportunity for those things to malfunction. You can take those kind of problems and just magnify it in this room. Dr. Nichols alluded in his talk, we had a breakdown yesterday because we'd had a power outage. So we had to go back and do some delicate work on this system to get it to come up and, and be able to be ready for Dr. Nichols to give his lecture. So um, even though this is very wonderful, it can be a, a, a problem and it can tend to drive you a little bit crazy. Because I have a dream. We were talking about planning and dreaming and there was a lot of planning and dreaming that went into this building. How many years was it, John, that it took to actually, from the start, 20-some years to actually get this building off the ground? I think 1973 was when the dream really started. And uh, it took all those years, and finally we moved in last fall and started actually functioning in the building. Uh, during the planning phase for the AV equipment, and the reason I was involved in doing the AV equipment is because the library is responsible for all the AV equipment on the campus. So we provided movie projectors, we did things in the other auditorium where we used to give core lectures, and we take care of lots of other AV equipment. So in doing that, we worked with the architects, we worked with an AV consultant, and we also had a campus committee, and John Nichols was part of that committee. So we we did all of those things and put together so that we had the right AV equipment in here to function. Uh, later on, I was also asked to assist in uh, purchasing furniture and selecting furniture for all the offices upstairs. So I became much more involved in the building than when it started out. And even Judy and I got involved in color selection, though please don't, if you love the colors in here, that's great. If you don't like them, don't blame it on Judy and I. <laughs> because we, we tried to exert our influence, but it became very small. If any of you have ever worked with architects and uh, interior decorators, you, you might understand that. We are sitting in the Shin Auditorium, and Dr. Nichols mentioned to you earlier it's named for Peter Shin. Um, not only was he very a very generous donor that helped build this building, he also is a graduate of St. Joseph's College in 1963 and he also served on the board of directors. And uh, currently he is a life member, which I understand means he's a member emeritus. He's no longer an active member of the board. But we appreciate his donation or we wouldn't be sitting here today. At the heart of the auditorium is a video projector. You can't see it from where you're sitting. I can look up and see it, but I have a picture of it for you. And it, it's on a little dolly, and it comes down out of the ceiling when we need it. And when we don't need it, it, it rises right back up into the, to the ceiling. And you can see all kinds of things through this video projector. You can see um, a VCR image. And I'm going to show you a little film clip right now to give you the flavor of what that is like. Lovely present, because we found out from our phone. <laughs> you, Dr. Kenny, you were not going to get a pie in the face this time. <laughs> Let me switch back to the computer image. The other images that we can see through the video projector are slides, and that's what you were seeing Father Gerlach doing in his presentation. We have a slide projector associated 
with the system where we actually see the image through the video projector. We also see the computer image, and that's what I am doing right now. What you're seeing in my presentation is coming through the computer. We also uh, can see the ELMO visualizer that uh, Dr. Nichols was using. And the nice thing about the ELMO visualizer, it looks like it's very futuristic looking, and we've all been very excited about it. You can see three-dimensional objects, and we're going to see that here in just a second. And we can zoom in, and we can focus. And the nice thing is for the science professors, they can do experiments on here. And the students will actually see it three-dimensionally instead of just showing transparencies. You can also show a book. You can bring a, a globe in if you want to. Uh, a lot of times they'll bring books from the library. I think Dr. Nichols yesterday was doing star charts and various things. But some of the faculty members still like to do transparencies, and that's what's nice about the ELMO visualizer. You can switch, and you can actually do transparencies. We can widen that shot, and you can see Garfield's having a little trouble with his computer. So the faculty members still want to use their, their transparencies that they've been using for years. They can do that also with the ELMO visualizer. So that, that's a real nice part of the system. We're going to go back to the computer again. And I want to talk a little bit about the sound system in here. The sound system is divided into two parts. We have the program part, which is what you heard when you heard Beethoven's fifth, and you heard Martin Luther King singing, saying, I have a dream. And you're hearing that through the two speakers behind me to the right and the left of the screen. And they're very powerful speakers, and I think they give a very nice sound to the program audio. So any of our VCR tapes that we're playing, any CDs that we might be playing, any audio cassettes that we might be playing, you're hearing through those speakers. The other part of the sound system is the presentation or the speaker sound, what you're hearing me through. And if you'll look up to the ceiling, I, you don't have to count them. There are supposed to be 57 speakers in this room. So that no matter where you're sitting, you should be able to hear what I'm saying. There's also a mechanism for the hearing impaired that if you sit directly under one of those speakers, it will amplify the sound for you and make it easier for you to hear. Also, we've positioned the screen for viewing from almost every seat. I'd love to say it was 100%, but we lose a little bit on some of these edge seats. But from almost any place in the room, you should be able to see the screen equally well. Another part of our sound system are the microphones. I can talk through this microphone if I choose to. Or, as you can tell, I'm wearing a lavalier mic like John and Father Gerlach were wearing when they were doing their presentations. I could walk all over the room and you should be able to hear me. The squawking that you were hearing Father Gerlach doing, there's just a few certain positions you can get in between these speakers that will set that off. It's really very rare in that it happens more in the Courtney Auditorium than it does in here. It's designed so that if I walk out underneath those speakers, it will quiet down and those speakers won't be being heard anymore so that, so that we do not get the feedback that you were hearing in the other room. We also have Handheld mics, that's what Judy was using. If we were going to have audience participation and have you ask questions, we could turn this on and pass it around the room. And we've actually done that in faculty meetings. And it's very nice. If the room was full, we can position regular microphones on microphone stands up the aisles. We have jacks in the floor. And we can lock those down and push the, the jacks in, set up the microphones, and then you could walk out to the microphone and speak to the person who's on the panel. So I think that's really nice. We've made this a very versatile room that, that we could use for a number of things. We've even talked about having town meetings or uh, having candidates out here, having panel discussions, or we could have presidential debates here even, I think. Uh, we, could have, we could have had Dole and Clinton right up here on our stage. I like to use this one. It makes me feel like Oprah Winfrey. And, uh, Mary Martin and I used to do a takeoff of Oprah Winfrey, so that we called her Oprah instead of Oprah. Lecturers can have a choice of projecting 35 millimeter slides either through the video projector, like we're doing now, 
or they can do it, if, you, if any of you can turn around, you can see there's two 35 millimeter slide projectors in that window back there. Many of our faculty members have a need for projecting side-by-side -side images of slides that they've done for comparison purposes. So they can also control those from, from the lectern up here. And the faculty members can have as much or as little control of what's going on as they want. I have a, what is called a touch screen, screen control panel right in front of me. And here's a picture of the lectern, and there's a picture of the the arrows right on that touch screen panel. So if I want complete control, I can use that to manipulate. I can turn the lights up. I can make that screen go up. I can make the sound go up. I can turn the sound down. I can do that all from my touch screen panel. In the other room, Cindy and I were using what we call our handheld control panel. We can also control everything by sitting out in the audience and doing that. So if we have a speaker who really doesn't want that much control, we can sit and control it remotely. As I mentioned earlier, the main purpose of this room is to uh, have core lecture presentations. And one of the things that we do is audio tape and videotape those lectures. We audio tape every lecture and we videotape some of those lectures. And we control that process in the AV booth. You can see we have monitors here. We have a mixer. We have two VCRs and we have a dual cassette player, a recorder player back there. You can't quite see the other side of it, but it's there. The reason that we videotape some of the lectures is that we do lecture presentations at our remote site at St. Elizabeth's uh, School down for our nursing students down in Lafayette. So the, the faculty member can then take the videotaped lecture down, the students watch the lecture, and then they do their core discussion groups right there. So it works, seems to work very well. And uh, with our little mixer that I was talking about earlier that's up here, we can get very fancy fade in and fade out shots. Uh, that's what Cindy's doing back in there right now. You can just, I can just see the top of her head. She's waving at me. She can fade back and forth from looking at me to seeing what's on the screen so that the students get a full view of everything that was going on in a particular lecture. Now we move back into the small lecture hall where you were before, and it's called the Courtney Auditorium, and it's named for William Courtney. He on, was on the board from 1978 to 1995 and has just recently become a member emeritus, just like Peter Shen. And also like Peter Shen, he donated, I don't know exactly how many dollars, but significant amount to help make this building possible. So we, we really appreciate the donations of both Mr. Courtney and Mr. Shen. The room, with the exception of the control booth that we've been talking about, does everything this room does. We were videotaping in there. We can do the Elmo visualizer. We can do these multimedia presentations from the computer. Uh, just everything that you can do in here. The only thing that is, is different is we do not have the mixer where we can do the fade in and fade out shots on uh, doing videotapes. But we also have two uh, 35 millimeter projectors, we could do side-by-side -side projecting of those as well. We control everything in these rooms from what I call Control Central. And the first time I saw this, I felt like I was at NASA and I was going to launch a rocket because that's what it looked like to me. And this is located in a room back to my right side, just behind the Courtney Auditorium. And this side of it controls the room that we're in now. The other part, the, the other three, control the Courtney Auditorium. As you can see, we have a monitor in there. We have a video player uh, and recorder. We, it, we also have a slide projector. We have a CD player. We have a dual cassette player. And we have all kinds of wonderful things, amplifiers, line conditioners. Can anybody explain to me what a line conditioner is? I'm not sure what it does, but it, it helps with, with this whole system. We have patch panels. We have all kinds of switching mechanisms and uh, controllers in, in this area. So it's quite a complicated system. And when we had the um, power outage the other night, it caused some of our pieces of equipment in there to reset themselves to the wrong place. So we had to go in and punch a few buttons and get everything back up the way it was supposed to run. 
Also in this building, we have a computer classroom. And you can see at the top of that computer classroom, we have a video projector similar to the one that we have in here and the one we have in the Courtney Auditorium. This is really nice because the faculty member can sit up at the front of the room facing the class with their computer, and they can demonstrate things on the computer for the students, which they can then see on the screen. When I took this shot, the screen was not down, but it's located. All they needed to do was put it down, and they would be able to do that. And that would save the faculty member from having to go from station to station to station to redemonstrate whatever it is they need to tell the class that day. There are 30 gateway computers in this room, which is really wonderful. The students love to go in there and use it. And when it's not being used as a classroom, it serves as a computer laboratory. And I believe it's open until 11 o'clock tonight. The students can go in and use it. Maybe some students in the room can tell me. I'm not sure exactly how late it is open. But it's a very nice classroom, and uh, the equipment's great. We, we really love it. In fact, I think the faculty members fight over being able to have classes in there. Dr. Nichols uh, told you and showed you on paper in a, in a one-dimensional setting what, about the core planning center. But here is a shot of it. Here we have a computer similar to the one that I'm using up here. We have a scanner. And that's how I got all these images into the computer. I took my 35 millimeter camera, went out, took shots of all the building, and uh, then I scanned them in and put them into my presentation. And the faculty members do that on a regular basis. We also have a laser printer, we have a CD player, and we have a monitor with a VCR in it. So the faculty members can duplicate almost everything that you can do in here. We don't have an Elmo visualizer up there, but uh, they could bring in an overhead projector if they needed to use one of those. And when he was talking about having meetings, this is the area where the faculty uh, members get together and have their planning meetings. And here's the wonderful library of core materials that he referred to. So it's a really nice room, and Dr. Nichols should get all the credit for that because he's the one who actually put it together and designed it. And I'll tell you, those chairs are wonderful. They roll around the room, they can go up and down, and they're very comfortable. So I, I imagine the faculty are very happy when they go in there. They don't have to sit on those hard chairs. Last but not least, we have a core classroom. We don't have a lot of equipment in there, but we do have a monitor and a VCR, which you see up here, and a screen and an overhead projector. This whole AV system was designed with expansion in mind. We have a patch panel where we can add equipment if we like. So we could put in a laser disc player, which we don't have right now. We could add extra VCRs if we needed them. Uh, we could put in more slide projectors if we needed them. And as equipment comes out, we should be able to put that into the system. One of our dreams is to get the correct equipment, once we have the money, to have a closed circuit system so that I could be giving this presentation in here and you could go in any one of the classrooms and sit down and see it on the monitor. We have the capability of doing that, but we just don't have all the equipment to do it yet. So we're hoping in the future we're going to be able to do that. Finally, we go back to the sculpture that Dr. Nichols showed you to remind you that the whole point of this building, including the AV equipment, is centered around the core program. And we hope the types of things that we put into this uh, AV system enhances what's going on in the core program. And I think that that is what is happening. The faculty members, besides uh, everything else they have to do, went to a workshop last year. We had 25 faculty members. And they learned how to do this multimedia pres type presentation like I am doing here. They put a lot of hours into it, and they did a wonderful job. And as you can see, it's hard enough to get up in front of a group and speak, but when you've got to remember all the buttons to push and make sure that everything works the way you want it, it puts a little bit greater demand on you. But the faculty here at St. Joseph's College have really taken up that challenge. And I think that they are put, making their very good lectures even better. I think it's great, besides, beside the auditory stimulation that the students get from a regular lecture with a few overheads, this is a little bit more creative and a little bit more stimulating and helps the students to learn and, and grasp the material that the faculty member is presenting to them.
before I have one more slide, but before I go on, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Anything I haven't told? How many classrooms? We have 10 classrooms. This auditorium seats 400 people, and the Courtney Auditorium seats 80 people. Do you know, John? I really don't know how many faculty members have offices in this building. But some faculty members are sharing an office, so somewhere over, just over 40. But we have over 60 faculty members, correct? I'm a faculty member, but I don't have an office in this building. So, um, and um, my reference librarian and uh, our catalog are also faculty members. We're housed in the library, so there's reasons for some faculty members not to be in this building. Well, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight, and I hope you've learned a little bit about our building and our system. And I wanted to, to uh, leave you with one, one final thought here. I've got to remember to push all the right buttons. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs>